Good day, Adam. How are you going? Going well. What about you? Good. Good, good, good. Looking forward to Christmas. <laughs> yeah. You're going anywhere exciting? I'm going to sneak off to Singapore for a few days. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. What about you? Oh, just um, New South Wales coast. So I'm sneaking a little bit of view nuts for dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Mm. Oh, I set my alarm for quarter to eight. Think I forgot it was 8.30. So I got on a quarter to eight and I was in a panic. Like, no one's here, no one's here. And then I realised, oh, I was half an hour early. <laughs> thanks for thanks for coming online for this. Uh, yeah, it's uh, good. I'll just let Mike Ban should be here soon. I hope. Yeah, I just send I just send him the normal um the normal invite. As in the what do you mean by the normal invite? Just the, the invite that came through. You know, to log into the webinar. Yeah. Oh, yeah, hopefully he should join pretty soon. Yeah, he'll he'll be right. He's a professional. <laughs> yeah, he'll be good. So um, yeah. So well, yeah, I thought Manish might be in here now too. But yeah, is Boomerang a room that you're logged in via, or is that a separate? I don't know. I think that must be the group that he's been hosting or something. Yeah. No, sir. We are managing the event. Yes. Sorry? We are managing the uh, Zoom. Oh, okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks. Well, we had 40 degree temperatures this time last week and it's 20 degrees today. <laughs> Climate's praying. <laughs> Now here's Michael. I mean, you're mute, Michael. Just on mute. How's that? Yeah, that's great. Hey, um, Michael, this is Richard Nile, uh, yep. Doctor Richard Nile, he, and Doctor Mike Bange. Um, Richard's um in New Delhi with at the well. You you, you can explain your position there, Richard. Uh, I'm Kieran and I work together as our two um ag ag people posted here from DAF. Yeah, ag council. Yeah, we met in... before. <laughs> so yeah, see if I can um... Well, hello everyone. I was just going to see if I can um, I could do uh, get rid of my fan. It's a little hot in here. Um. <laughs> I just think I was just saying to um, Richard it was forty degrees last week that this you know on on Thursday and this week it's twenty degrees here. It's uh... yeah, I know it's amazing, isn't it? Like, uh, well, Richard, we had we had bushfires here outside Narrabri, and it was like Armageddon on Tuesday, and uh, storms came through, and there was fires going up everywhere, and then we've got we've had sixty mils of rain. Which you know it was, you know, it was just, oh yeah, just amazing. <laughs> <It's fantastic. laughs> um, Michael, can I introduce you to um, uh, Mr. Daga, Manish Daga? Um, Manish, this is uh, Michael Banj. I think you may have met him up at the um, ICAC conference, but um, yeah, it's um, Manish is hosting us um, on the webinar tonight. Uh, Michael. Yes, can you hear me now? I can hear you, Manish. How are you going? Absolutely fine. How about you, Dr. Mike? I, I'm doing I'm doing well. And apologies to Richard and Adam that I didn't jump on. I I, I had a I literally had to swap computers. Um for whatever reason the Zoom decided to do a uh, an update and it wouldn't install it and then wouldn't let me join. So I had I had a backup, so thank goodness. Good, good. Definitely. So nice to see you again after meeting uh, physically during the ICAC memory meet. Yeah, it was a very big week, Manish. Very big week. I was, uh, well, uh, I, 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 I left um, 
Mumbai on um, Friday afternoon. I, I, I managed to spend two days in Delhi uh, and travelled to the Taj Mahal on the Saturday, which is just uh, and the Agra Fort, which was just mind blowing, and uh, and then spent a day with some actually day with um, an Australian colleague's um, family who was in Delhi. So. Yes, that was pretty amazing. And you also had brought your family, so you need day to devote some time for the family also. Yeah, yeah, that was good. Well, they had plenty of fun without me during while the conferences were on. So, and it was a big event, you know, receiving the award, and we are all proud of you, Dr. Mike. Yeah, thank you, Manish. It was good. I, and look, I really enjoyed the the conference, uh, the Asian, you know, Asian Cotton Research Conference. That was pretty uh, incredible in meeting, you know, a lot of the uh, Indian researchers. And uh, I I was exhausted because I didn't stop talking. I think for two days, so <laughs> meeting them. Right, right. There we, we we do have a lot of you know rich uh, research scientists. Uh, um, what do you say asset available in India, and uh, with people like you, you know the whole intention of engaging uh, Adam and Richard for this webinar series is how we can exchange, you know, for. For the betterment because india is a country of smallholder farmers on one side and we have corporate manufacturers on the other side so the yep. textile is are very well organized they are uh, um, corporate manufacturer which can be an uh, you know asset for australia for bilateral trade for indian farmers definitely what you have done with australian farmers can there be some learning out of that i mean can uh, hello the farmers somehow hello Anish bhai. Yeah. uh sorry to interrupt uh we have one minute two three so can start at three, right? Sure, sure. We will start at three. We are yeah, so three. who is going to start the uh summer the year already? Uh not yet. Not yet. I will start then. Then I will introduce uh, uh, all the attendees and introduce uh, Dr. Mike and then we can get started. Sorry, done. Noted, sir. Noted. Fine. Thank you. Mr. Manish, I must also um, convey my apologies for not being able to attend the... Uh, the... Samarth is here, Samarth is here. I'm admitting Samarth. Yeah. Uh, and I'm uh, admitting everyone from, from the waiting room and muting all. Yes. So please, I will please. just give the access to the speakers and then they can uh, unmute at, 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 any, at any point of time. Yeah. Yeah. So, Samarth, would you be uh, comfortable opening once we start? Yes, sir. Yes, Samad. Thank you. Samad is an uh, aspiring uh, techno commercial uh, in our group. He is a very bright student of agriculture, and uh, it would be a big learning for him also, Dr. Mike, you know, listening to what uh, you have to say about increasing productivity vis a vis what Australia has done. Yes, Richard, you were sh sharing something. Oh, I was just saying I must convey my apologies for not um, being able to attend ICAC this year. I was really hoping to be there, but unfortunately, yes. um, I, it was the very first time I'd taken leave all year after a very busy uh, G20 year. Um, but I'm hopeful that I'll be there at Barat Tex in February. Um, so if you will be at Barat Tex, I'll hopefully be able to see you in person uh, again. Yes, I can. Uh, <laughs> yeah, admit everyone can start now. Someone is or somewhere you can start. Yes, you can give the count, Vivek, and then, then some others start. Hello, yeah, good afternoon, start. everyone. Welcome no, to we Australia start. India. Am I audible? You are, Samad, yes. Yes, Okay. Hello, and welcome to Australia India Cotton Collaboration uh, webinar series. Uh, as we know, Australia has the uh, highest yield and top exporter of the cotton, and India is the biggest producer of the cotton and top exporter of textiles. India have the largest area, but uh, for the productivity, Australia is uh, topping the world. So I welcome everyone, all the dignitaries in this webinar series. And uh, I would like to invite uh, Manish Daga, sir, to address the speakers and welcome everyone. Please, sir, over to you. Thank you, Samad, and welcome all of you to this second series of uh, webinar that uh, Australia-India Cotton Collaboration 
platform is offering for all of you. It is not only an education series. The whole intent is to strategize the way ahead and to execute the whole outcome of increasing productivity of cotton across the world, especially in India, because India is a very, very major component as far as the land is concerned. 37% of world land under cotton cultivation comes from India. But unfortunately, only 25% of produce comes from India. And that is where the gap is. And India is a country majorly of smallholder farmers where we want them to grow and be part of the core supply chain. On the other side, we have seen Australia consistently perform on the uh, cotton productivity front. They have worked very hard. They have organized, systemized their cotton agriculture process. And in spite and despite of all the agroclimatic challenges that they have and even market fluctuations that the farmers even there are experiencing, the yield has remained consistent. It has grown consistently. So what is the key to that growing yield and the, and the consistent yield that Australia is achieving? Second is the quality part. The quality of Australian cotton is extraordinarily a good and that is why it fetches a fair premium it is most in demand across the world and what is the core reason for maintaining the quality on the other hand asset wise india has a lot of manufacturing ability in textiles in conventional textiles organic textiles in te technical textiles and that can be a big opportunity for bilateral trade between the two countries, we would love to have a special niche area for Australian cotton made textile producers. One day we would have you know, that uh, special, special window open for the Indian uh, manufacturers. That is one thing that uh, we are planning ahead. What can be specially done to increase bilateral trade between these two very significant countries, Australia and India in um, world cotton scenario. The whole intention uh, is shared with you and this is uh, just the beginning, the webinar series. We have started with seed. Today, we are going to focus on soil and the person who is going to present on soil is none other than Dr. Michael Banch from Australia. Before introducing him, I would like to introduce two of my very close friends. One is Dr. Uh, one is Mr. Adam K from Cotton Australia. And he is the key person in Australian cotton reaching out across the world, a very big contributor to uh, promoting Australian cotton, to promoting productivity and quality simultaneously and maintaining that across the years. The second person I would like to introduce is Dr. Richard Neal. He's from the Australian High Commission Agriculture Division. Again, a core Australian by heart, but by soul, I can say he is more of an Indian right now. And I have seen him so much interact with the Indians so comfortably that I would be surprised if somebody took him, believe that he is an Indian uh, altogether. Even he dresses very aesthetically. Um, welcome both of you, Adam and Richard, and a special welcome to Dr. Michael Banch. Dr. Banch is a cotton systems agronomist of 30 years delivering innovation and substantial impact for substantial cotton for, for sustainable cotton production. He is currently the commercial research manager with cotton seed distributors in Australia, supporting investment in grower-facing research. Before this, he was a chief scientist with the CSIRO Australia, where he led initiatives in cropping systems research, physiology, and agronomy into managing abiotic stress fiber quality initiatives across the whole value chain, crop nutrition, climate change impacts, and water use efficiency. His career has also involved delivery of decision support systems for assisting crop management and knowledge dissemination. So important, knowledge dissemination is so important. One can have the knowledge individually, one can have the knowledge collectively, but to disseminate that across the supply chain upward and downwards is so vital. Recognition of his contributions in cotton physiology and agronomy was acknowledged with the prestigious USA, USA Beltwide Cotton Award in 2017 and in 2019 with a Service to Cotton Science Award from the Association of Australian Cotton Scientists. He is a Fulbright Scholar with long-standing international collaborations 
especially in the USA. So across the borders of Australia, also he has been very active and he's currently the ICAC, International Court and Advisory Committee, Researcher of the Year 2023. Hearty congratulations to you, Dr. Mike, and welcome to this webinar series of Australia-India Cotton Collaboration. Over to you, sir. What have you done in Australia? What is happening in Australia? And any case study that you wish to share and what can be the learning for Indian smallholder farmers or the farmer producer organizations? Where do we get started? We'll come up with questions after you present, but we are all very keen, eager, and very curious to know what you have done in Australia to create this magic. Oh, thank you, Milesh, and thank, uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I've, I've had that introduction um, rolled out to me a few times in the, in the last few weeks uh, uh, in India, which has been really, uh, it's a great honor. Um, after being to, to India in, in the last couple of weeks and, and met so many great people to be able to uh, share even more uh, of some of the things that we've done as uh, researchers here in Australia and, and, and as an industry. Um, so uh, very, very excited about presenting and, and having a conversation with you all today. Uh, look, clearly the one thing that uh, uh, was uh, uh, an exceptional part of my uh, visit to India was was meeting with all the researchers, uh, the industry people in India, and uh, uh, seeing the opportunity in terms of dialogue around the the things that the researchers were learning um, with the small landholders and developing the systems there, and, and certainly the things that we've uh, been able to achieve in Australia. And actually, uh, uh, you know, despite the the obvious differences in the systems, there's some very clear uh, similarities in uh, a cotton plant, I, I always say, a cotton plant that grows in Australia is the same cotton plant that grows in India. It just it, um, the knowledge, the knowledge uh, that we've learned here can be can be applied um, in in other parts of the world. It just we just sometimes have a little bit different uh, inputs into the system um, compared to to what you have. So I, I Manish, you, you mentioned that I was going to talk about soils. I know that you've actually had all that already. I am actually not going to talk about soils. I'm actually doing the seed production, uh, seed production part. Um, a colleague of mine from Cotton Seed Distributors, Oliver Knox, presented on soils, I think, a few weeks back. And in, in a few weeks' time, you mentioned about the dissemination part. And uh, a colleague and a close friend of mine, uh, Kavina, will be presenting that. And, and I'll be supporting her in a few weeks or when we choose to, to, to present on those those things we've done to, to deliver those messages to grower in our very our quite variable climate. So I, I'm just get, give me a, a minute, everyone, uh, a few seconds to share my screen with the presentation. Uh, I'll put this in presentation mode. Okay, everyone. So I one of the really uh, important things, <laughs> important achievements that have ha has ensured uh, productivity in Australia, no doubt, is uh, our access to uh, uh, great varieties that have been bred by CSIRO um, and and with cotton seed distributed through our cotton breeding joint ventures. So I'm going to spend uh, the first half of this presentation just talking a little about the way we go about breeding varieties. Um, the the and I, you know, in, in giving this presentation, I have to acknowledge that, you know, certainly I am not a cotton breeder for one. And uh, uh, you know, I've worked closely with these two gentlemen here over the years when I was working with CSIRO, who are the cotton breeding team. And you know, I think actually I would have to say one of, one of the key ingredients that we have in terms of uh, uh, delivering success in our industry is our ability to collaborate and interact. And that, that's been a key ingredient that we've uh, across disciplines and and across all parts of the industry to, to deliver on these outcomes. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. So I, I duly have to acknowledge my colleagues um, and past colleagues, Warwick Stiller and Ian Wilson, who, who uh, for the first part of this presentation, are, um, are very much the, the contributors. A little bit of history about Australian cotton. Uh, we've certainly faced some um, significant challenges that have defined our, our efforts and our research over many years. Uh, in in the early parts of the of the uh, early 
parts of times of the industry back in the 1960s and, and through into the 1970s. Um, our biggest challenges were pests and uh, insect pests and weeds. Um, and as the more we developed systems to control that, uh, and we, we started to grow better crops, uh, diseases quickly rolled in. Uh, we, we developed considerable pesticide resistance, in fact, to the point that uh, we nearly uh, were, were close to not growing cotton at all because we had nothing to control the pests with. Um, the other thing was that we had soil compaction, and I know that's certainly an issue discussed uh, amongst many many of the researchers and farmers that I met in, in India um, when, when you consider machinery and mechanisation. And, and, and from a social perspective, the fact that we were using considerable amounts of, of pesticides and herbicides um, that the the thought of the communities weren't necessarily happy um, about um, that amount of pesticide being used and there was there was instances where there were large amounts of pesticides detected in rivers and streams which which didn't go down well with the local communities today we you know with the advent of uh, genetically modified technologies and uh, there's no doubt that we we've been able to at least wrangle um, insect pests and, and weeds are a little little easier than we had in the past um, with those technologies. Uh, constant, we are we are a, we are one of the driest continents on the earth, so uh, a constant challenge for us is how we make best of the water that we have, given that we are predominantly irrigated cotton systems. Uh, rising costs of production and um, and other commodities. Um, competing against cotton are certainly challenges that we have to face in the competing market. We have regulatory constraints around the way we, we some uh, aspects of our system and certainly in our access to water is, are regulated, um, as I say, competing land uses, and no doubt the sustainability, um, in, so environmental and social governance, things around carbon um, and, and greenhouse gas emissions are certainly something challenging us. And Manish, I think, you know, you, you highlighted for me that, you know, the, the important part of what Australia delivers the world cotton market is our is our high quality cotton and uh that's you know we 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 it is the we, first we, choice you know for indian textile mills who are looking for contamination free cotton yes so you know it that is definitely uh a major emphasis of in, any of our thinking in the way we go about our production is that we we know that we have to produce produce high quality cotton um just to, to meet the market so as I said, I'm going to start this presentation talking about our cotton breeding um, objectives and, and the way we go about it because uh, we don't we breed uh, uh, we don't breed hybrid for hybrids. We breed um, you know varieties um, that you know, don't require the sort of hybrid system. Uh, our emphases are on increased yield. Um, we, at the moment, we are maintaining an increase in yield of about three percent per annum across the industry. Um, there's some challenges that are starting to emerge around um, how we keep that going, um, but at the moment we're still uh, finding means and uh, and uh, traits within our our conventional breeding program that are delivering those outcomes. I was, as mentioned, the fibre quality, we have some significant disease challenges, um, and one of the reasons for significant disease challenges in Australia is because of our high inputs. When you add when you irrigate cotton um, frequently and you add lots of nutrition, uh, it's great for cotton growing in warm conditions, but it's also the, um, some of the best conditions for diseases. So that, that remains a significant focus for us in terms of uh, um, delivering our varieties. Um, one of the things we do have a, we do have a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, our cotton grown across considerable latitudes in Australia, um, probably much more than even India, you know, from top to bottom in terms of uh, where we actually grow cotton. So uh, we have a, a, a strong emphasis on um, ensuring that we have some, we have varieties that are, are well adapted to regions. And and another challenge that we have, certainly, and, you know, this is what is, is important to us, for us to actually take our germplasm and embed the GM traits that we actually have uh, present. Uh, that is a considerable uh, cost and impost on us ensuring that we, we we get those varieties there. And I'll talk a little bit about why that that is a significant cost in 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 uh, getting varieties to market. Um, I'll just move on. I think it, it, most people would be familiar with you know sort of the standard breeding 
pipeline where we're taking many, many plants, uh, we're selecting, putting, uh, and certainly in Australia, we put large selection pressure on. Um, we actually, uh, one of the uh, ethoses of, of breeding in Australia is that we put strong uh, selection pressure on yield and quality, you know, uh, as opposed to uh, selective breeding on traits like things, things like um, disease or whatever. So we use the yield and the fibre quality as the key things that actually tell us whether our um, varieties are actually pushing back on disease or, or push uh, becoming climate resilient and those sort of things. And that has been a really key ingredient um, in the success of the breeding program. And I know that sounds really a little bit from left field, but it has been the key to, to that success. So we've had researchers working closely with the CSIRO breeding program, looking on selective breeding for things like traits for heat tolerance and, and things. But the, the, the Australian breeding program has never lost sight of that uh, yield and quality are the things that the growers need and the markets need um, and the this, this, this heaviest selection pressure on those two attributes. And obviously, the other part of the breeding program is, is integrating um, the GM traits and, and any other single gene traits into, into, into the cotton. And we get lots and lots of lots and lots of outcomes. Some, uh, men, most, uh, most actually get thrown in the bin, and 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 some actually you know move through to, to actually um, producing varieties. Here, here is the challenge that we face, um, and and needs to be often recognised in in bringing uh, elite germplasm to market is that we have a conventional breeding program, which does not involve anything genetically modified. Um, selecting, uh, taking large populations of uh, hopefully diverse germplasm, undertaking, selecting for uh, yield and quality, going through these uh, back crossing um, uh, F1, F2 through to F9 selections to, to get that particular variety. And then we, we, get, we get an elite germplasm uh, that has no transgenic traits uh, and then then we start the process all over again, you know, to actually take a sink, you know, a gene for a bulgard or one gene for a bulgard, and then we have to go through a back crossing process to to actually integrate that gene. Currently, the technologies and we are up to five, nearly six um, GM traits um, integrating into the our elite germplasm, and each one of those traits is essentially a new breeding program to to bring those through because you, those genes are not stacked. Or they're not a cassette. You have to, you know, back cross those individually back into into the into that germplasm. And this is even before we start to bring it out in the commercial arena um, to test these things and and upscale um, and and get the the enough seed to produce the growers. So just you know, I think there's a few technologies. I mean, there's talk of you know cassetting genes um, for GM traits that might speed that up. Um, but I, I highlight one of the other challenges that we face. Um, if we go back to the conventional germplasm development, uh, a significant challenge that we're facing now is um, most of our growers grow um, GM cotton and finding areas where we can, uh, finding growers and finding areas where we can't, uh, where no one, where somebody's prepared to perhaps spray insecticides and not spray herbicides over the top of cotton to actually breed um, look after our conventional germ germplasm it is a real challenge. So um, it's something that has emerged um, as a challenge in terms of this breeding pipeline is something that needs to be considered um, to bring these sort of things to market. I mentioned I mentioned the uh, you know three percent per year. This is the average yield um, for Australia over over those years. We, we can, we're fortunately continuing to to uh, to, to uh, continue that trend. Uh, we've seen a little bit of uh, challenges emerging from one of the, the key traits that um, has enabled us to actually um, deliver high yields is a, is a characteristic called gin, gin turnout or gin out term. Um, it's one of the, the key characteristics that has enabled us to get higher link yields. We're, we've probably reached the limit in terms of uh, that particular characteristic simply because uh, the seeds are getting um, too small. Um, Small that they uh, can, it, well, they can't be ginned in our current gin, ginning systems, and actually bring significant challenges in, in our ability to take small seeds, give to farmers to actually establish appropriately when conditions are not perfect. So we, 
some of the agronomic challenges have now emerged and, and pushing the frontiers around um, uh, yield increases. So th this has sort of changed uh, in recent years, has changed the emphasis on uh, the focus of some traits that are being yield components to deliver um, improved yields to back on opportunities around resilience for stress and also things like improving photosynthesis and biomass of the crops in, in relation and things like water use efficiency and nitrogen nutrient use efficiency, which I'll talk a little, little bit about in a minute. I think you'll find as as I talk as I'm going along talking, um, you know, I've had the I've had the luxury of, you know, spending a week or so in India and uh, I what I have found is that, you know, I'm sort of giving the same presentation um, that many of the Indian researchers, you know, were talking about the important things that need to be delivered uh, and probably really the differences, of, the only differences are at times are really uh, about the scale of the way we go about doing things, but certainly we can learn from each other. Um, so I mentioned that we, uh, that the challenges in, in, in the way we go about do this is actually um, identifying the trait and then incorporating these traits into a commercial cultivar. Uh, we must ensure that these things are uh, inherited, that they're heritable, and that's that's certainly a thing, a thing that we have to test while we're going through, through this. Um, a constant challenge is how we act, accurately measure the trait. Um, so I didn't mention uh, around, certainly with our GM traits, it's, it's nearly as large as a single breeding program. We have a quality assurance program where you know we're testing DNA uh, using PCR tech, you know, PCR machines uh, and those sort of things to actually ensure that we, uh, we're we getting the right transgenes or the right genes flowing through our material and, and we're not contaminating things we're, or ensuring that we're actually delivering the, the right genes to market as much as anything and things are not contaminated. So, and, you know, another another challenge is, is trying to create, you know, constantly trying to bring this diversity into the breed, breeding program. Um, and, you know, that that's... Uh, fortunately, the the cotton breeders around the world, you know, still um, uh, are able to share germplasm, uh, not commercial germplasm, but you know, native germplasm across uh, across continents, which which continue to enable that. Um, so we talked talked a little bit about, um, you know, maybe I've talked about some of the easy breeding, the single gene stuff, but when I start to talk about things like photosynthesis heat tolerance, uh, biomass growth, and those sort of things. Uh, really, uh, the challenge here is that it doesn't involve genes. And it's it's, it's multi-gene. And, and when we get to multi-gene genetic type um, traits, such as things like photosynthesis, it gets, it gets very complex and, and it changes the timelines in terms of what we um, have to do in terms of delivering outcomes. So here's... Uh, this is the sort of population sort of dynamics that we have to actually contend with. You know, we're moving a single gene. We're selecting, you know, looking for one in four plants, five genes, you know, one in one in 2,000, 1,024 plants. And when we start to get up to these, you know, gene um, stacks where we're getting um, nearly eight, eight types of genes, native or GM, uh, we're having to select, you know, looking for the, we're truly looking for the needle in the haystack. And that really means we've got to come up with better and unique ways to find find um, find that needle in that haystack. So I'm uh, really going to reflect on some of the uh, the investment that we are undertaking in in breeding. Uh, we're certainly using uh, DNA uh, marker technology. Uh, uh, so we're using uh, genotyping and uh, uh, geno genome-wide selection um, techniques to, to, to actually, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, We're using things like artificial intelligence, both building models of the genotype, um, the genotype and then phenotype, and actually linking that to how those things respond in different environments. So uh, we can start to pick and select genes that are specific to environment, and it won't be long that we'll be starting to ask questions around picking particular genotypes that actually um, suit management regimes, whether they be um, irrigated or rain-fed, for example. No doubt uh, gene editing is, is going to be offering uh, lots of opportunities. Uh, the use of uh, RNAi technologies, uh, CRISPR, um, Cas9 um, technologies is something that we, we, we're looking heavily at 
um, and looking heavily at these sort of things because there are in a regulatory environment they're not seen as genetically modified and um, potentially a lot easier to regulate and bring to market and 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 in a final point and i'll talk again talk all through these is that is use of uh, smart vision things like drones you know mobile phenotyping platforms uh, satellite technologies to help select for, for different traits and, and look you know to be able to look for them uh, at least try to look look for those needles in a very very large haystack as we talked about sorry so uh, the reason why we can move very much to the you know, clearly and, and, and almost uniquely the reason why we're moving to this dna and age, dna and age you know doing profiles of dna of, of seeds is the cost has come down to make it affordable um we can we can do you know you know, tens of thousands of, of, of DNA profiling, just like Ancestry.com and those sort of things out there in terms of trying to understand what's out there. Um, we, we, we can understand by building models and those things, we can identify with those regions and those where those genes that are important to traits. And we've, we've actually uh, sequencing that DNA from, from chipping the seed, like this diagram here. So we're actually finding out whether uh, we're increasing our chances of finding that needle in the haystack before we have to go and plant that seed in the ground, uh, which obviously is uh, significantly less cost by chipping that seed than actually taking a variety through a whole breed, um, oh, sorry, a genotype through a whole breeding program um, to work out what those characteristics and, and any of that. So we're simply increasing our chances of finding that needle in the haystack by doing this DNA profiling. I'm oh, sorry. Um, so, Warwick, we, we talk about Warwick as our, you know, our current thinker in terms of the selection process. So, traditionally, the breeder is the person who is making that decision about what varieties to keep in and keep out. Uh, but we quickly move into building, uh, have the DNA profiles, we have characterising, putting lots of emphasis on characterising the environment for management that cotton will be growing in. Um, so, building models that represent the environment, and we have performance characteristics of those particular genes that we've measured in the field, throwing those things in a uh, artificial intelligence model and, and, and doing the genomic prediction and, and then selecting which seeds are going to um, you know, be taken through the program. And essentially, in many ways, taking away the, the physical breeder, make, the breeder making that physical decision in that early part of that breeding program. Uh, I mentioned gene editing. Um, I probably mentioned the, ma the major key things there, the, the fact that things like Cas9 and CRISPR, uh, uh, you know, they offer, we can take bits of genes of the same uh, species, insert those characteristics and swap out the genes for, for new genes. And that's not necessarily seen as genetically modified. And we can bring some of those characteristics to market. Now, we're saying that we're doing this, but it's, we're still a long way of actually, you know, bringing something like this successfully to market. Um, um, and certainly incorporating it into a commercial breeding pro program. So, um, and and I have to say that the IP environment certainly in, in this part of the world hasn't quite settled on. Um, so I say that they're not looking at it, looking at this being GM, um, but it, it's not uh, fair to complain that um, we can actually um, bring these technologies to market. Um, many many of you would say, you know, that, that there's satellites out there. You know, we're using drones um, you know, or using thermal imagery. We use that camera imagery right down to using handheld instruments to work out how many hairs are on a on a on a cotton leaf. And you know, one of the ones we do, we've certainly used and, and processing lots of material to bring through the breeding program is this, you know identifying hairs on a on cotton leaves. So the less hairs that are on um, some of our genotypes uh, make them make the varieties less conducive to, to aphids and white flies. Um, and uh, therefore, we, we build in sort of um, what we call host plant resistance into our varieties by, by using some of these technologies. Still, I think the challenge in this technology is that uh, there's lots of, been lots of promise around these technologies, uh, and lots of data collected, but not necessarily the skills uh, in place to, to, to wrangle these. So I think one of the, the, the things that CSIRO as an organisation has done is employed what they call uh, data ranks. 
even data agronomists to to actually be strongly focused on uh, flying. Uh, I suppose the, the, the example here is flying the drone is the easy part. Um, sorting through the data is the, the complicated part. So there's been much much more investment on 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 the data wrangling side. Um, and you know, really, it's the future breeding is really about taking all those ingredients and and, and putting putting them in. Um, successfully into a commercial breeding program. So, Manisha, I wonder, you know, I, I don't know how you want to do this, but that, that sort of concludes my, my the breeding part of my presentation. Um, uh, maybe I take a few questions, have a bit of a pause before I talk in and really, you know, refer to the fact that, my, that our success in Australia around bringing and producing that yield it has not all been about the breeding. And we'll talk a, a lot about that in a minute. Right. Happy to take a few take a few questions to break it up a bit. I I start to get sick of hearing my own voice after a while. Correct. I have been already receiving a lot of questions. Uh, Mike and I welcome you know attendees from Texprosil, the Textile Export Promotion Council, from MCX, from uh, Indian corporate mill sector like uh, Wellspun and Pratibha, and from Sorcery who are promoting organic cotton in India. So uh, there are also some farmer producer organization uh, directors who are attending. I welcome all of you. Some questions that I have received is, uh, I'll take one or two before you go ahead, that uh, the, uh, all the seeds used in Australia, are they all GM seeds? I, I, I'm going to, I, I don't know the exact figure, but it's up there with 99.9%. Nine percent. Uh, the, there's <laughs> Can't predominantly be the, than that two hundred. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the predominantly the growers grow GM varieties, uh, and most grow, uh, most grow, most grow varieties with the insect protection traits. Sorry, they mostly grow. All, the most of them grow uh, all the cotton with insect protection traits and the herbicide traits together. Okay. One of the things, one of the things that Australians have to do to protect the technology is grow uh, cotton that does not have the insect insect you know, insect traits um, contained with them. So they often will have the herbicide trait in them, but no insecticide tra trait, and that's a, a means to actually uh, manage the resistance of the pests and protect the technology. So what uh, the, the easiest description is: the grower is actually obliged to grow some of this non uh, insecticide, insecticide GM trait, the the bugs that grow live in the the non insecticide trait cotton, mixed with the GM cotton and dilute the resistance, and that's how we manage and keep push back on the resistance of our and maintain our GM traits for insecticide resistant uh, for insects. That is a very critical balance. So. Does the seed contribute to uh, you know, the pest resistance, uh, the ping ball worm issue that is now actually devastating Indian uh, productivity right now? And does it also contribute to the land being uh, or the crop being more more climate resilient? Uh, uh, yes, so that, that is, that's an interesting question, Manisha. It Certainly the, the insecticide traits actually fundamentally protect our crop from insects. Um, we don't have resistance to our traits um, so they are being effective and that's why we value value looking after them because and and basically uh, the growers get value out of that by not uh, by um, by not spraying as often um, and and the second part of that question is really because the growers no longer have to spend all their time focusing on the insects they're able to spend more time on managing other parts of their system such as irrigation and fertility and those things. And that's that's been the big shift in Australia in the last 20 years. 20, 20 plus years ago, when Adam's on this call, and he will remember it, and it was in his time as, a, as an agronomist, it was all about managing the insects. And things like irrigation management and fertility and fibre quality all came second to managing the insects. So now we actually have a situation where the insects are not a, uh, insects and the weeds, the weeds are no longer the focus of our management regime. It's a more balanced agro agronomic package. 
it's a big relief because most of the time the farmers are actually engaged and engrossed and it also not only the time aspect but also the cost is uh, aspect the expense is uh, so much more and focus is so much more on pest management that the nutrition management takes a back seat sometimes yes that's right now i have, we have to declare that the thing the thing that Australian growers do do, though, is they pay a license fee to get access to the technology. So, you know, there is still a cost to the grower financially. Um, but as as you say, the the fact that you can spend more time and more focus on other aspects of the season uh, allows you to produce more yield. And notwithstanding the social benefits and the community benefits, that there are less pesticides moving around in the environment. Um, and that's a really important um an important aspect of our system that we we can get up and say that we, we're not using the chemicals um, that um, that can harm the environment and harm yeah harm the environment so yes farm soil and environment so it is a hazard uh, for everyone yep uh, one more question that i saw on my screen right now maybe from one of the consumers of australian cotton is there anything specific being done to increase the tenacity, the strength of, of Australian cotton? Uh, uh, yes, and, and that's uh, that's a great question. And I, you know, I was going to talk a little bit about my about fibre quality. Absolutely. Um, constant selection pressure on uh, maintaining uh, a balanced micron air, increasing strength, increasing length. Um, and I would say that the other aspect that's been um, the other aspect that the breeders have been spending a lot of time on what goes with strength is the elongation and the work to break ratio um, on that sense. So not only do we want stronger cotton, uh, we want cotton that's uh, a little bit more flexible um, from that and before it actually breaks. So they're absolutely um, uh, focus, focuses of a foci of um, the breeding program. One of the things we have found and we do know is that uh, trying to uh, we're obviously balancing the fact that yield, we need to increase yield to push back on the, the cost pressures and the, and the farmers' needs to, to be sustainable um, from an economic and social perspective, is that um, fiber, those fibre quality traits are negatively correlated with yield. So there's a strong emphasis on trying to break that, break that, um, that correlation. But there are genotypes there that don't um, fit that need. Um, fit that niche but they're not necessarily the highest yielding um, varieties so we're uh, we're still pursuing that one niche and we know that that's something that the international mar market wants thanks thanks dr mike being part of the icac organizing committee event one of the suggestions that i had given regarding the what can be the punchline for the event is cotton available affordable and adaptable so yep. the industry, you know, has to uh, look at all the three aspects and especially the producing side has to look at all three to suffice the uh, needs of the industry. So strength would definitely be one of that. And um, uh, one of the questions that has come is uh, how many years does it take to certify and commercially sell a seed in Australia? I mean, is there a process of expedition or it's a general process that nobody can change? Uh, once you, you know, uh, yeah, a, a, again, a great admin, question. Thank admin, you. Admin. Yeah, thank you for asking that. Whoever ever did, and I did, I failed to point that out. We're to bring a, a variety, a variety to market, um, from that start of that conventional breeding program right through to in, in embedding the uh, 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 GM traits. We're talking 15 to 20 years, so it's a long investment and. Uh, I, I suppose that's, you know, one of the things that, you know, the, the breeding team, Siro so, so, so breeding team wanted to actually, you know, why I've actually structured this presentation today, those technologies that, you know, I talked about in terms of the gene, geno, gen, genotyping, genome-wide selection, AI, uh, phenotyping, are those technologies that we're hoping that will actually, you know, speed up that process and, and, and increase the yield gain. But yeah, fifteen to twenty years. It's uh, it's a long, long process, especially when you're trying to embed. Uh, in much less if we if we just were had conventional varieties with no GM traits. Uh, but every time we add another GM trait at the moment, adds time to bringing it to market. And you know we can build we can uh, 
not necessarily investing more in a breeding program and making it bigger um, delivers those efficiencies because it just it just gets too unwieldy unwieldy you're trying to find you keep trying to find one as i said a needle in, in such a large haystack um, and just being bigger um, it doesn't necessarily help you find it i'm um, um... I'm a little surprised it takes so long in Australia. I did like buying a house in Mumbai, New York, Tokyo, or Sydney. It can be only once in 20 years that you can do that. And even for yep. seeds, we thought Australia, I mean, uh, the process would be different. In India, it is very similar. It takes eight to 10 years uh, minimum in order to get a certified seed rolling in the commercial market. So is it the same phenomena world over, Dr. Mike? You have um, been definitely, you know, associated with so many um, countries, what they are working. Is it a common phenomena? Well, well, Manish, yeah, uh, yes, at this scale it is. If you want all those sort of traits, yes, it, it does simply just take that time, you know, as we until we bring some of these modern technologies on board, that just simply is the reality. So the, the varieties that we're, the varieties that Australian growers are getting today um, came out of the conventional breeding program 10 years ago to be integrated um, with the GM traits. So some of the some of the new GM traits that are coming along that have been announced, uh, Australian you know, Australian growers will not get those till with to get them at, uh, embedded in the adapted uh, varieties for Australia. Uh, we won't see them to 2035. So we talk about them today, but we're planning for 10 years of time. Um, Very, you have uh, to have a vision and a roadmap for that vision to uh, uh, yep. be executed. I agree with you, and uh, so nice of you to share that. How many varieties are available for commercial sale right now in Australia? I mean, what uh, does the farmer have, basically? Uh, I, I would say probably, uh, I should know this since I was about seven. Okay. Right, and they have been the same across the last 15, 20 years? Uh, no, probably, no, that, that we've been releasing new ones. Uh, we, we, have, we potentially have the ability to release new ones every year because, but they're just the ones that were a little bit further in the pipeline from one year to the next. But we, we don't necessarily drop out um, successful varieties. If we have a variety uh, that it remains successful and growers are comfortable with it and they know how to grow it, you know, we, we keep that in the market. Um, but we are about to go through a, a significant transition. Um, we're bringing the, uh, what they call the Extend Flex um, technologies, a new herbicide trait. Um, come next year, we will replace all the varieties with the new Extend. Now, potentially, if we get reg um, regulatory approval, we'll actually um, replace all the varieties with the new Extend Flex varieties. And that's simply also the fact that we don't want to mix up um, having varieties in the market that uh, people, that there's a mix of technologies that you know threaten both resistance and you know put growers at risk in terms of you know the way they use them. So we don't want them confusing a variety that might be tolerant to a herbicide that is, and and one that isn't. So, um, Manisha, I wonder whether it's if that's a good junction to to launch into the second part of the. The just presentation. One more question, Mike. If okay. Yep. There are so many. I'm just choosing you know, the best suitable. Can uh, we use the seeds in Australia? I mean, have they been used in other countries as a seed exchange or a technology exchange? And can India uh, be the beneficiary of such technology exchange? Well, that, I, I, I was prepared for that question. It's not an easy question. So we, yes, we we have had some of our um, germplasm shared in other parts of the world. There's currently arrangements with, uh, uh, well, our commercial partner um, in terms of um, providing germplasm in the international market is, is Bayer. Um, and, we, and we actually you know clearly one of the, the markets that we actually extend to is the USA at, at the moment. And in terms of, uh, well, I can answer this question because I, I, I you know, obviously it was approached when I was in India and people were asking me the same question around this sort of stuff. You know, my basically my response is because we're actually contractually obliged through Bayer as an international partner, the, the, the people that you need to talk to about getting access to germplasm are Bayer themselves. So, um, so uh, you know, people can reach out to me and I can put those, you know, if you're interested, I can put, put you in contact with those people that can, you know, send you to the right people to have that discussion. 
But yes, we have got germplasm um, accessible internationally through our partnership with Bayer. Please do that, Mike. That would be very uh, interesting also. And I think going ahead, it would be very beneficial also. Right. Yep. Uh, yes, you may take up the second part of your presentation. And then okay. if you have any questions pertaining to that, we will again pester you with <laughs> more questions. Okay. Well, uh, really, this, this, the, the, this second part is not as long as the first part. Um, but it's really just highlighting that, you know, uh, our success in Australia uh, in producing and delivering high yields is, is really been a systems achievement. Um, you know, we've we've uh, built great great agronomic systems around our varieties. Uh, we've uh, built systems that are adaptable to our environment and respond appropriately to the environment. And notwithstanding that, our farming systems, you know, our our best management programs, all those things, you know, can all conspire to to help our our farming systems and our farms and our growers um, achieve achieve their outcomes. So, uh, sort of a bit of evidence that we know. That we've, it, as I said, it's not been all about the varieties. Is is the fact that we we have these uh, studies where we take for take the varieties that we grew. Uh, as an example, here we grew varieties in uh, in oh, what's my mouse here go? Varieties in right that we produced and released from 1980 to 1994. And this this line that I'm pointing to on my screen is the yield increase uh, during that time, and that's. That that yield increase associated with that line is essentially due to due to the variety, um, just improvements in the variety. We take those same varieties, we grew them in 1995 to 2009, and we continue to do these studies. But this is the published study, um, and we see that if you know, the fact that that line is now those same varieties, that line is higher than the one before, we can as we can we can say that that's due to improvement in management. Uh, associated with our systems um, and the fact that that line is not parallel to that dotted line means that we've actually had an interaction where the management and the varieties uh, together have interacted to produce um, you know extra yield so the varieties alone we estimate uh, deliver 48 percent of our yield improvement uh, management alone delivers 28 percent and that interaction of management and varieties delivers 24 percent Really important. So we're saying here that you know the success of Australian uh, cotton production, um, you know, more than more than fifty percent has been associated with improvements in management. Um, and this this uh, ironically is not even before we start to take into account any of the GM um, traits. So you know, conceivably, um, management could have, could actually be a little bit higher um, because we have more time associated with the, the GM. Uh, another, you know, it, it would be remiss of me to, you know, we management mentioned that quality is a uh, a significant factor in in ensuring that we, you know, we, we deliver to market. Uh, what we've what we've done in one of our early campaigns, realising we had to continue to meet this this sort of outcome. There's no doubt the breeders, you know, produce, continue to forge ahead in producing the quality traits. Is we adopted this uh, thing called well, as I said, we're dealing with genetics by environment, by management, but you can actually consider these sort of things right across the value chain. And I know that um, being in India recently, this was a lot of discussion about, you know, looking after cotton from, you know, taking it from the field and, you know, delivering it to mills and, and, and delivering quality, quality products. So we, we've developed management packages um, and processes where we, we basically start with inherent quality and we're doing everything and coming up with management techniques all along that um, value chain to to avoid um, quality moving from this blue line, um, you know, and 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 getting to, or sitting on this black line. So it, it involves you know dealing with the problems in the field, um, choosing the right variety, uh, ginning the, the you know ginning the cotton appropriately, and then actually processing um, cotton. Appropriately, so we were able to show things like uh, the type of defoliation uh, and the time of defoliation that you would undertake, you know, in preparing for harvest, would have, if we didn't consider it carefully, would have significant implications in terms of uh, the blueness or the dying uptake 
of, of fabric at, um, at, the, at the other end. And we use those sort of campaigns to educate growers on why they needed to, when we're making those recommendations, it's not just about yield, but it's actually how you're affecting the market and, and the process in downstream. Um, and this, this, this manual here, which you can search online, is, is, is our, our attempt to, to document that and um, build campaigns around um, helping growers to manage the quality and, and, and ginners and, uh, and, and all those along the value chain. I, I, wanted, to, uh, I wanted to bring this up. Uh, around population studies, because that was certainly a, a topic when I was there, and lots of conversation around, um, and a clear, a clear conversation, a clear, you know, uh, uh, area where you know we as two nations can talk and, and actually share notes around in terms of you know how this popul how we manage these populations and and uh, achieve better outcomes. So, uh, doing after doing my calculations, you know, in the the high density cotton uh, in in India and, and speaking with everyone, the irony is that the the plant populations that you know many people are talking about having greater successes with the small landholders is actually equivalent to what we use in Australia in terms of rate bed production. So, you know, there's straight away there's similarities you know emerging there in terms of what we can share. Um, so, this is our optimum plant population at Aero um, for our rain fed cotton systems in Australia. So, very similar to what what your what the researchers are investigating um, currently in India. Uh, another thing uh, which was a very topical discussion um, while I was in India was about the type of genotype that goes with uh, with these high higher plant populations. And you know, one of the things I was definitely having a conversation with the, the researchers is that we've investigated um, many genotypes. Uh, with different morphology and different traits in these different population systems, and this, this uh, in this diagram here, this is sort of a, a traditional cotton plant um, in terms of architecture. The one that's that I'm pointing to now is what we call a stovepipe variety, um, short internode length. It was conceived to be a, a variety bred for high plant populations, and uh, much of our research has essentially shown that this cluster type or the stovepipe variety. In fact, it takes away a lot of the flexibility and the resilience of the cotton plant when when different environments are exposed to. So this is definitely a uh, love to spend you know, have connect our researchers with the Indian um, industry to talk about this this very problem and 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 what sort of varieties do respond in these different populations because um, we've spent a lot of time working in this area. So definitely a, an opportunity there. Um, I know that again, along with this, uh, along with this, this con concept of high density plant population and uh, and these different types of varieties, um, clearly we've um, and and a tendency to pr produce varieties that are more determinate and mature earlier. We we find in our systems um, that when we tend to shorten the maturity, we tend to lower the yield. So we actually, uh, again, the irony is that we in it. Our same our, our best variety in our high input irrigated system is the same variety that performs best in our rain fed um, systems. And that's because it actually has the ability to regrow and has less, um, it's actually more indeterminate. Um, so, again, an area that I think would be a, a very fruitful area for discussion across the two nations in terms of uh, what we've learned around varieties and their, their morphology and their dynamics and how they relate to these different systems and population. Understand that. The desire to to bring in varieties of the bring in crops earlier to avoid the, the pink bollworm, but I, I probably my first reaction is it's probably potentially achieved better through management than maybe trying to manipulate varieties, and that that's certainly a topic for discussion from that perspective. Uh, and and you know we've spent large amounts of research to try to understand you know what what why varieties actually different in terms of maturity. Uh, We've done studies from varieties from all over the world, uh, looking at their different characteristics, and essentially what makes a variety earlier. Um, it's maybe not a change in morphology; it's just it lays down squares much more quickly and and builds up that fruit load and cuts out earlier. So, um, again, having that discussion about what are the if we if 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 the Indian researchers and the breeders choose to to actually um, breed type, certain types of varieties, we'd love to share the knowledge. 
of what sort of characteristics those varieties need to have to, to achieve yield and the oil and S together. Uh, another another uh, technique that I I wanted to raise around rate bend production was something we use heavily in Australia in our, our systems is this concept of skip rows, um, and the the concept here is that you either sow plants you know or every row and this is a meter spacing you might uh, miss a row you might miss two rows you might spread the rows out here but a wide row you might miss every second row. And even two rows, but even uh, wider space. Now that's, you know, all our rain bed growers actually use these different types of configurations to build resilience in the system. So sometimes they might take away yield, um, but consistently it, it provides a platform in terms of maintaining yield and quality. Um, so uh, it, what, it, what it does is that when plants get stressed, um, and start to run out of water, they actually have accessibility through the soil profile, have accessibility for the water, to the water for longer. The, the impact on yield is less, but the um, overall, but the, it builds resilience in the system. So questions like, do you want to have high, a high yield one year and then a very low yield the next? This thing tends to average out the yield um, consistently um, uh, across system. So we've done much work to show and this is uh, this graph here, a little bit complex. This is a solid yield, which is where every every row sown uh, skip yields. Um, and these have various configurations, and there's there's different yield thresholds here where um, the yields start to decline. Obviously, as a yield potential, you know, if you've got lots of water and lots of moisture, you want to fill in the in the space with plants. But when the when the popular uh, when there's more stress in the environment, you can build resilience in the system simply because you've actually got a little bit more area uh, for the for the plants to access water. Um, and the, the clear advantage for this, uh, and from a grower profitability point of view, is that they don't incur discounts uh, from, um, from fibre quality um, losses. So if we compare solid here, which is full configuration to different skip rows, you can see here at, at harvest, these, these skip row configurations have better fibre length um, and the growers get less yield, um, discounts um, or deliver better quality cotton as a result of, of those things with, with very small yield penalties. But they, they, their profitability is, is often better. I'm nearly finished, everyone. Um, close to the slide. We, you know, I did mention, uh, so that were the, some of the things that we've been, I just wanted to mention you know, the concept as things that we're doing to improve water use efficiency. Uh, you know, at the, at the rain fed level, and there's many, many others. I would, I would be here talking all night about the things that we're doing on water. I uh, wanted to mention that we're very strong emphasis on uh, nutrient use efficiency, um, both from managing the fertilised costs, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and the desire to be, you know, more sustainable. And we, we, we spend time screening genotypes for nutrient use efficiency, or in this case, is nitrogen use efficiency, and we, we see outliers. Oh, sorry. Um, we see these sort of outliers here where they this great nutrient use efficiency. Um, and we, we then take those varieties. And we, what, what's important about the way we go about doing this is that we don't uh, wait 20 years and then produce a variety and then go and test it um, in different systems. We, we grab that variety and then we'll put it in a system that, you know, might have high fertility um, uh, with different, you know, in this case, this line here, sorry, it's behind the screen. I think that's uh, favour beans or vetch at that top line there. And uh, it's we we would actually then go and screen the performance of that variety in a, in a, uh, the use of things like cover crops and um, crop rotations to really drive nutrient use efficiency home. So if you take a high high yielding um, nutrient use efficiency variety and make sure that it actually responds in something that you know can reduce the overall fertilizer input by using things like crop rotation and, and nutrition. And we're, we're discovering unique things like the type of nitrogen, the organic nitrogen or the makeup of the um, the soil microbial environment are, are keys to actually getting the best performance out of some of these varieties um, at times. Um, I mentioned, you know, we, we're spending, uh, have we continue to try to come up with different techniques uh, around uh, screening for things like heat tolerance and, and, and water. Um, and this is some work that, you know, actually had an Indian 
student working with me um, screening screening using different techniques to, to try to come up with a, a simple way to screen for genotypes that have heat tolerance. Um, and you can see some of this this sim here. I think that comes from um, subcontinent that that particular genotype. And uh, the higher the higher these values here, the less tolerant. So that this these varieties here on the right are very much the Australian varieties. Um, and you know they're not even close. All oh, these commercial ones over here are not even close in terms of heat tolerance to some of the Indian subcontinent. They're high yielding. Uh, but in the very high temperatures, they're not necessarily um, performing well. Uh, got a long way to go in terms of, and, and again, falling back to some of the genotyping and omics approaches to probably help solve those problems. Um, you know, I, given some of my emphasis has been on climate change over the years, uh, you know, another, and I know one of, the, I can't remember the name of the researcher that I met in, in Mumbai, I know that there are these efforts going on in India around understanding uh, climate change impacts. This this graph is really just to highlight that um, we actually see differences. Um, we've been able to inherently breed for uh, uh, improvements in photosynthesis in response to um, um, CO2. But the, the, the fact that these sort of responses are similar means we haven't actually put any selection pressure on, on exploiting um, CO2 response. So the message here is that uh, at some time, somewhere in the world, somebody you know should start to screen um, germplasm in higher CO2, higher high temperature environments to exploit that that opportunity beyond just the the standard breeding improvements that we're bringing through in our germplasm. And thank you, Manish. That's it. Uh, that's it is uh, so much uh, to learn uh, dr mike and uh, so much to understand uh, thank you very much and still i invite you to take take some of the questions that have been coming up are you comfortable are you going to you reading a i'll just take a few uh, okay uh, what is the um, plant uh, ideal plant population followed in Australia and what would be best? I mean, 60,000 to 80,000 plants per hectare that you said was uh, the ideal mix for both, uh, both the country. But uh, uh, plant to plant, uh, what is the ideal that you would recommend for India? Because being uh, more than 65% uh, rain fed here in India. Yeah, well, I, well it, the, the research is the research that's showing um, improvements in these high density, you know, Indian high density plant systems seems to be around that six to eight plants, um, uh, six to eight plants. So um, I think it's it's not uh, it's not a coincidence that you know you're getting those high yields uh, when when the system allows it to happen. And obviously, there's lots of other things that need to en enable that um, to happen, but uh, it's a it's a balance between not having too much competition um, between the plants, but enough to actually uh, enough to have to fill in the space to produce the yield um, when when there are stresses stresses there. So, you know, I, I think uh, I think it's no coincidence that so what we call our uh, rain fed population is what you consider the your high higher uh, density populations that people are starting to find high yields. From that perspective, uh, the opportunity probably exists around how you manage that and get the right varieties. And I think that's this this that area. I think, yeah, I think this this area is the is the the ripe fruit for discussion across the two nations. Um, True, that is a critical balance that we need to uh, uh, somehow find out and then manage. And I think Australia and you, especially Dr. Banch, can be a big help here. Is there is there any specific directions that the farmers follow or recommended? I mean, east to west or north to south at the time of sowing. Uh, it, it, it's a it's a question that comes up often. Uh, there, because of our high radiation environment during summer, uh, maybe for a few days early in the season, it makes a difference. You know, north to south, but uh, uh, after those few days, uh, that difference goes away. Our our radiation environments generally are, are very saturated and um, the directions don't make much of a difference. 
notwithstanding that, we have some very cool environments um, where cotton is grown in, in beds uh, in our southern growing regions, which are very cool. There are sometimes advantages to have uh, uh, rows sown north or south that help get the, gets the crop established. The beds are simply warmer. Right. And uh, what about crop rotation and biodiversity? Any uh, uh, Anything, uh, I mean, specifically recommended? Or a farmer can continue to grow cotton for five, seven years at a stretch? Yeah. So uh, we our, our typical rotation is, is generally two two years cotton, two or three years cotton, one year wheat uh, at the moment. Uh, we're getting a little challenge with that with disease. So as I mentioned, disease remains one of our biggest challenges from that perspective. So a uh, massive amount of research and investment in Australia going into disease and a large part of that is investigating crop rotations. Uh, uh, we've got every crop rotation and every cover crop being investigated to to push back on the disease, but also trying to maintain that, you know, get the benefits of the crop rotation from a sustainability and uh, soil fertility, soil health perspective. It, you know, the uh, man, many of you on this call would, you know, I think this is the whole soil health uh, crop rotation aspect is is the front one of those agricultural frontiers that we've yet to fully exploit. And I think, you know, it, when any time I've written uh, articles about where the next frontier in terms of yield improvement would come from is actually probably improving soil health. True. One question that has been consistently in a coming from Mr. Suresh Kotak, he is known as the cotton man of India. You must have met him during the ICAC, he is my BMP, Australia. Mm -hmm. so, whoa, how much that has impacted and if you can just share in brief what is actually being done there. Well, uh, well, uh, when I reflect on my career in Australian cotton and, and the, the impact that my BMP had, uh, it really, in, in conjunction with, in conjunction with the release of uh, GM technologies, it was the catalyst to 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 manage our pesticide um, issues, and we needed to to adopt these practices to to have the social license to farm uh, across uh, across the community. So. It, it's it's probably you know I've talked a lot about the technological side, um, you know, in terms of things we do in research and those sort of things. But the the other part of the equation is about how we we manage the farm, we manage the crop that uh, in a sustainable way, and being able to report on that so we we can meet those meet those credentials and so we have the social license to farm. Uh, and I suppose the opportunity for, uh, you know, the opportunity going forward is how we use that information in us. In a uh, gov, uh, sorry, traceability and um, provenance sort of sense going forward, you know, we and um, be able to stand up uh, like uh, the rest of the colleagues, our you know, industries across the world, and say our, our cotton is truly sustainable. So the metrics around that are important from a, a reporting perspective. But a, a key ingredient uh, I know from the very early days around uh, implementation of my BMP was never disconnecting. The, the the metrics and the things that we need to measure and understand and do that from the productivity components. So, um, they, you know, that a lot of that's been developed in light of, you know, the appropriate technologies and, and systems that are there to, to deliver on things like high yield. So, they, one, in many ways, it's the, the, the BMP matching up with the, the technology and, and finding, as you said, Manish, a bit of a compromise on, on, on what's appropriate. Yes, but that balance, that that critical balance, is so vital. Yep. Yeah. And if you know, really put simply, if we didn't have systems like my my BMP, we wouldn't have anything. We'd we the technology would be dominating, and not the social license and all those other factors uh, be there. You need both. Yes, and and that collaborative effort of all the stakeholders that that is also so important, and in the decisions that are taken are more informed decisions. Uh, by, by the farmers also and by the stakeholders also, who is the main contributor, you know, to this consistent productivity? I just, you can rate one, two, three, four, I just name some options. Is it the farmer? Is it the government and research associations? Is it the industry or trade associations? Or is it the input companies? Oh, that, that's an interesting question. Well, there's no doubt. The reason why we, uh, is, uh, there's no doubt 
that uh, that uh, the growers are the ones that are actually delivering the transformation. Um, I think I, I'd like to think that you know we all together as an industry we all I think that uh, you know a, a, as an agronomist I, I hope that I've contributed to that um, 30 or 40 percent that's been associated with management with new management techniques. The breeders have contributed 48 percent. They can declare that you know the genetics. Um, but we see that interaction there, and it highlights the fact that uh, the reason why we've achieved these things is we've been working together to deliver those outcomes. And uh, one of the, you know, we we are we do have the luxury in Australia that we're not a large industry in terms of numbers, um, and there'd be very few people, there'd be very few people that you know Adam and I don't know that work across the industry or we haven't collaborated in some form or fashion. And you know that's, um, you know, I. I you know, you, Manish, you would have seen my presentation at the uh, Asian Cotton Research Conference. You know, uh, basically my catch cry, uh, success is all about collaboration. True. Together we can succeed. That is the key, I think. And uh, anyone of the attendees, do you wish to ask anything before we conclude this session? Okay, there are some repeat questions, but I think most of them have been addressed. And uh, I take this opportunity now, looking at the two beautiful pictures on screen, we can have this ecosystem where everyone feels comfortable being part of the system, especially in cotton and textile uh, supply chain, if we help the smallholder farmers or the farmers maintain a good productivity and maintain an environmental balance also along with the economical balance and uh, definitely it is going to be ultimately a collaborative effort like the Australian uh, 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 government, the stakeholders and the farmers have been doing it since so many years and this was the major learning out of today's uh, webinar, focusing on seed and the importance of seed, the significance of seed in terms of productivity is immense but we need to realize it's a very slow process of bringing new seeds, what changes we can make, what exchanges we can make with the world, staying staying uh, a par, at par with the world uh, in terms of technology is the key, you know, that we can um, um, make this impactive change here. And I uh, thank all of you who have been uh, part of the organizing, especially Adam K from in Australia, um, Dr. Richard Rial from uh, Australian High Commission Agriculture and a very special thanks to Dr. Mike Banks for being so patient for our questions and so clear in the presentation. And uh, thank you all those who have attended. Three seeds as per, you know, a basic, uh, we can say, uh, a raw uh, assessment, determine the yield, seed, soil and weather, we have addressed soil in webinar number one. Dr. Oliver Knox has delivered an excellent presentation on how soil health can uh, determine uh, a contributory impact on increasing cotton yield. Today, uh, Dr. Mike Bang has emphatically uh, presented how seed can be a contributor and how a collaborative effort can contribute to increasing and maintaining productivity as well as quality balance for a country uh, of cotton producing country in the third series we of this webinar will be addressing how weather can you know be uh, be mapped adapted and um, uh, informed to the farmer so that they can manage their agriculture well thank you all of you i just have a hindi uh, saying for all of you and uh, the indians would understand for you all i would explain it beej mein ho jaan to kapas pehlwan if the seed is strong, then the cotton is bound to be strong. Kapas pahelwan, to kharidar meherwan. If the cotton is strong enough, the buyer is happy. Or kharidar meherwan, to kisan dhanwan. If the fiber is strong enough and qualitative enough, then the farmer is always going to be wealthy. So healthier the fiber, wealthier the farmer. That was what, and all this comes from the seed. That is why I connected this. Thank you all of you and uh, thanks for being part of this educative series. Going ahead, we are going to do much more. Right now, we have started with this webinar series and best wishes to all of you. Thank you.